morning. So we have Allison Knight with us today. She's going to talk about her uh, career as an engineer and kind of walk us through some of the fun parts of her job. Um, Allison, can you give us a little introduction, please? Yeah, so I'm Allison Knight. Um, I um, got a degree in industrial and systems engineering. Um, you might go how, and I actually work in healthcare. So I worked at Mayo Clinic. Um, and you might say, well, it says industrial engineer. Um, sometimes we're called manufacturing engineers, um, but more recently we're called systems engineers um, because really um, our profession started in industry. So started like working in actually Henry Ford who designed the car um, really was one of the founders of industrial engineering um, when they figured out how to make a car on an assembly line. So. Um, saying all that, so they've actually found that we started an industry, but now as um, our profession has just really grown and said, like, how could we work in other spaces? And so probably 20 years ago, um, healthcare decided like, hey, this might be a really good way. Um, or uh, They started hiring engineers and saying, can you look at this? And actually at um, Mayo Clinic was actually a forerunner in that. So they actually, started um, kind of a, they called it systems and procedures, but actually started very early on having a group that really focused on process and the systems. Um, so it's a really cool, cool place to be. Absolutely. So what did you do before your experience with Mayo? Like what kind of got you to that position? Yeah, yeah. So um, if we go way back, so when I was in eighth grade, <laughs> um, I actually took an interest inventory test. Um, it was on paper and it was offered at school. And it said that I should be an aerospace engineer. And I was like, I don't know what that is. I don't know what aerospace means. I don't know what engineer means. Um, no one in my family was an engineer. I didn't even know what that was. So what did I do? This was really before um, like having computers that you can just look up things really easily. So I went to the encyclopedia and I <laughs> looked up aerospace engineers and um, I got fascinated with the idea that I could use math and science to solve problems. Um, and I still wasn't sure like what this meant, but I just kind of, I really liked math. Um, and so I just kind of kept it in the back of my mind and then I kind of kept in high school. Um, I just kept taking a lot of math. I took a lot of science. That's pretty much um, what I knew about it. And I said like, okay, during high school, I did look at other engineering disciplines like electrical engineering and aerospace engineering, by the way, is like planes, like designing um, airplanes. Um, and so I looked at mechanical engineering, I looked at, and I kind of bounced around, but all of them, any type of engineering really needed math and science. Um, and so I really just focused on that and said, you know what, I can figure out what kind later. Um, but then by the time I was a senior in high school, I had found industrial engineering and industrial and systems engineering. And I really liked it because I, I definitely liked working with people um, and they, industrial and systems engineers, um, how it was described to me at that time was really looking at processes and looking at people and how does that work. Um, and I would say my mom was an occupational health nurse. So what worked with people in jobs to make sure they stayed healthy. And one of the things that industrial engineers did was they looked at how do you design a process so people don't get hurt, um, so workers don't get hurt. So there was like a human factors and ergonomics part to it. And that was really interesting. Um, at that point, I didn't really know that um, industrial engineers could work other places outside of like a manufacturing process. Right. Um, but I just thought like being able to solve problems that included people and how to make a widget. So I wasn't really designing the widget. I was designing the process of making the widget was really um, exciting. So um, that's really where I started. And then, um, so then, you know, it was kind of, uh, I started in, I started an industrial engineering program. I was all set that maybe I would change my mind, but it was really a good fit for me. Um, and again, I had a lot of math and science in 
college, um, but it was really fun to marry the, the people part of that too. Absolutely. Uh, do you mind sharing where you went to college? Oh yeah. So I grew up in Tennessee. So I went to Tennessee Tech University. Um, so that is actually, um, it's a, it, when I was there, it was like 9,000 students, about a third of them were engineers. So it was a big engineering school, um, but it was a, it was kind of a small university. So it was kind of between Nashville and Knoxville. And then I actually, um, so I, I did my undergrad there, um, then went and worked um, for um, a simulation consulting company. And you're like, what is simulation? So simulation is when we look at a process and we actually use a computer to model it. So um, one of the cool projects um, I worked on was that um, was with McDonald's. So everybody like now at McDonald's, um, you guys have probably seen that they have very different drive through processes than other fast food restaurants. So they have maybe like the side by side drive through where there's two order points or some of the McDonald's have like an order, like two order points, like one right in front of the other. Um, my company really worked on um, modeling those for McDonald's before they decided to build them across the country. You can imagine that, okay, you have this great idea, like you're at McDonald's and you're like thinking about how to make drive through better. And you're like, ah, what if we put two side by side? And somebody would be like, well, that could really cause a problem. <laughs> and somebody goes, well, how would you know? Well, you could build one and try it, but you'd have to, you know, spend that money to actually physically build it. And then you'd have to try it. And maybe it would work at this store, but it wouldn't work at this other store. So we would build a computer model that did that. So they could try it. And what they found was different ordering configurations worked differently depending on how the store was placed you know if it was if it had two entrances if it had different entrances if the, the um, volume of their um, customers were a little different and so um, that was the kinds of things we did so we so we did a lot so um, I did a lot of computer coding then um, and tried but I was going in understanding the process and then um, and then building a model around it to try to answer questions that could then help them understand the problem. And we did simulation models for like distribution centers um, for like um, rail. So it's really expensive to put, um, like if you have a rail yard um, where you wanna store your um, some rail cars, it's really expensive to put additional rail in and go, well, I hope it'll work. So we, um, we would model it for, and then make sure that the congestion, really, it really would help with congestion in the rail yard. Um, and then we also actually worked for like manufacturing companies to help them again with their processes. So there's a lot of different industries I worked in there, um, which was really kind of fun. You got to learn about how this things work. And so the other thing um, you might be like, if you, um, you know, how it works, you know, was a, a TV show, right? That was on and I'm sure there's still reruns. Um, that was actually kind of my job. Like you could go and you just go in and figure out like, how does this, how does this get made or how it's made? You know, how, I think that's how it works and how it's made. How it's made was kind of my job. You got to go in these other industries and figure out how does this get made and then figure out like, how can we help solve their issues? So that was like really a fun thing to see a lot of difference. Um, and, and it really showed that really this kind of engineering can work across a lot of different industries, which is really exciting to me. So, and then I went and did um, my master's at University of Alabama Huntsville. Um, so really there, I had a lot of colleagues that were working in um, defense. Um, that was a huge, like um, NASA's down there. They have the, um, and then they have Redstone Arsenal. So there are a lot of, um, and they were wanting a lot of system engineers because you can imagine you put these huge um, um, uh, equipment together, these very complex um, pieces of equipment and you need somebody that understands like how all this is gonna go together. You need electrical engineers that understand the electrical 
electrical parts of it, you need mechanical engineers, but then you need someone to help like put all the pieces together and make sure that the electrical talks to the mechanical and all that good stuff. So, um, so that was really fun to um, find out kind of that kind of work too um, in uh, Huntsville. So Within then, oh, sorry, I, go ahead. Well, no, go ahead. And then I uh, applied to Mayo. So I was really excited to work at Mayo. Mayo was my first healthcare experience. I have to say, my all my extended family is from Wisconsin. So my um, parents went to UW Eau Claire. So this oh. was actually an opportunity moving to Minnesota. So there was kind of a, a double bonus because I got to work at Mayo Clinic and really understand healthcare because um, that's really what I wanted to do. And Mayo was willing to hire someone that didn't have healthcare experience, but had, again, a process background. Sure. Um, and so <clears throat> I hired into, at that time, it was called System Number Procedures. Now it's called Management Engineering and Consulting. Um, and it's an internal kind of a, a group. I started there. And, but it was really great because then I was really living with, um, like I had always lived in, in the South growing up. So we always had to drive up to see my grandparents or whatever. And I was actually now very close. So it was really nice to live that close um, to my extended family because I never really had that before. Um, so yeah, so there was kind of a, 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 a kind of also an incentive. And then my parents were all, my parents still, um, live in Tennessee where I grew up and um, but they were driving up anyway to see a son and family so it kind of worked out so um, that that was really nice and I kind of knew what I was getting into having family um, up in Minnesota <laughs> so yeah. Um, but yeah so then um, I yeah so I came, came to Mayo and I again I started in kind of a internal consulting group and so what that means really is that we were um, like um, projects were identified in the hospital or in the clinic that would that needed that needed our expertise. Um, and so actually I had a um, pretty uh, interesting role in where I was dedicated to surgery. So um, kind of all the surgical processes. And so I um, did like projects that came out of surgery. So I looked at how do we, um, um, treat patients with diabetes through surgery and make sure like all the testing is happening because you want to make sure people's blood glucose is in check through that. Um, and then how do you make sure um, all like everybody in the process knows this patient's a diabetic, they need to be tested. So it was really like an end to end, look at the process, look at what we need to do with our electronic medical record to help with that. Um, so again, just just looking at other, a lot of processes that like, how can we make this better? Or if things weren't working quite right, how can we make it, or we might want to design a whole new process. Um, so um, also um, I, one of the other projects was in the outpatient clinic. So sometimes we were having trouble in one of our surgical areas where the patient, a patient would call and want um, a certain, have a certain issue that they wanted um, to, to see an appointment, have an appointment for. And because we weren't asking maybe the right questions, the, the appointment would get made with, um, it would be in the right department, but maybe with not the best, um, the most the best providers. So sometimes maybe it was like, oh, you know, they, then the provider saw the patient was like, you know what? Yes, I can help you with this, but actually let me have you also see this other um, provider. Well, that really meant that then the patient is going to see two different um, people. So we were trying to figure out what questions, what better questions can we ask the patient so that we get the patient to the right provider at the right time. And also making sure that if there's like an urgency to it, that if it's like, okay, if it's this certain thing, we need to see them right away um, versus, you know, obviously we always want to make sure people are seen in a good amount of time, but we want to make sure also that if, it, if it's super urgent that we get them in. So making sure that we know the right, you know, we see the right patient at the right, right time with the right provider. Um, it was really important. And so that was really fascinating because it's really not, it's, it's very complex to make sure we get, you know, when you just, when patients have symptoms that we understand like where to um, triage those symptoms and make sure the right provider sees that patient. So that was interesting. How long does it, and I'm sure it's, it's different for each, problem to solution. 
Um, what's kind of the timeline of getting approached by somebody and saying, we need to look at this to saying, yeah, okay, no, thank you, we're done. So um, in a perfect world, if you knew exactly what the problem was, you had good data and you just knew, okay, we know exactly what the problem is and we're gonna use our data to understand like what are some solutions and then implement them. It could be as quick as like 90 days. Again, a lot of that time is trying to bring people together um, because one thing that you know that we know is that the best solutions come when we have everybody at the table. So sometimes it just takes a little bit to get everybody there. But in all honesty, a lot of things work a lot longer, like maybe they'd be six months to a year, only because a lot of times at the beginning, we're having to really understand what the problem is. A lot of times we just see symptoms of a problem. So for the, um, uh, for the patients that we were looking at for um, the, um, uh, the clinics where we we're trying to get them to the right place at the right time, it was really a problem where we, they were like symptoms, we had way more patients needing appointments than we had appointments, which meant that then for certain, and then they would see somebody and they're like, oh, this isn't really the patient that, like, I wasn't able to help that patient as much. I need to get them into a different appointment. So you're trying to really make sure that we have the right patient because we didn't have enough capacity. So that was like a symptom, but really when we started digging into it, it was like, oh, well, maybe we're not descriptive enough with the types of appointments that everybody needs. And then maybe we're not asking the right questions. And maybe um, we need to really understand, like um, maybe we're seeing them in this um, area, but really this other area has capacity and they could really help that patient as well. So I think a lot of it really is a lot of my time is really understanding, okay, what is the root cause of the problem? Um, so what is it that we're actually trying to fix and then being able to measure what is actually happening. So sometimes understanding like, um, is this, do we have the right data? So sometimes then getting the data, either if you're manually collecting it, like through observation. So there, I do a lot of observation and say like how, what works, what doesn't, or do a lot of interviews with staff about what works or what doesn't. But then, um, but then also looking more, um, more deeply into, okay, getting everybody in the room and really talking through this. And a lot of times people, some people think uh, the problem is A, um, other people think the problem is B, and usually they're somewhere in the middle, right? Because not everybody sees the whole process. So a lot of my job is like bringing everybody together and saying like, okay, let's talk about the whole process and call that a process map, but let's like talk about the whole process and through that, usually we see like, wow, okay, yeah, that's the problem, or this is a problem. And then we can prioritize fixing it. Um, but I think that, so it, it's hard to say, but um, I think it's always, there's definitely a, port, a part that um, we shouldn't be going in with. Sometimes I'll get approached by saying, okay, we found this great tool and we want to implement it. And my first question is, well, what problem are we trying to solve with that tool to make sure that the tool might be totally appropriate, but let's make sure we know what, what problem we're trying to solve before we like implement something and then it not work because maybe we didn't address some of the other causes of the problem. So, um, so a lot of it is a little bit of detective work. There's a lot of detective work and really listening and trying to really understand from a lot of different people's perspectives, what's really going on. So there's a little bit of detective work, a lot of listening, and then trying to like bring all these ideas together. Um, and hopefully with my fresh eyes, I'm not working in the process, right? So I, I'm with my fresh eyes, I might be able to see something or make an observation that someone else who's, again, when you're in a process, it's really hard to kind of see it. So sometimes I'm just leaning in with like fresh eyes. Not that I had any amazing idea, but through interviewing a lot of people or talk to other people and trying to put these ideas together, it can kind of spur um, some other um, changes or updates or things like that. So. The other thing I would say is that in my career, I've also had to really use project management a lot. So you might have other um, disciplines that have project 
management. I actually, in my engineering degree, project management was part of it. And so when I say project management, that's just making sure that like when we start a project that we continue to keep it going and making, so you're kind of the point person to say, okay, you're doing this, we're doing this, we need to keep this going. And so it's both kind of engineer, but then also like project manager to make sure that we are meeting our timelines and, and getting things done. So that's another part of my job as well. What other different positions are part of a team that works through these kind of problems, especially in a healthcare setting? Like how big is the team and what are some other options to be involved in that? Okay, that's a great question. So one thing is we want to include everybody that has any part in the process. Um, so it, so um, it might be multiple different kinds of physicians. It will be nurses. It will be like for this clinic um, project, when we're looking at process, we wanna get the people that schedule the appointments involved. We want the people that answer the phones involved. Um, the people that um, actually take the person um, that meets, greets the patient when they come to your appointment and then takes them back to the room because all of those people have a really good sense of what's going on. Um, and so a lot of times they, um, when you start talking to them, they know what the problem is immediately, <laughs> or they can say like, this, this is why this happens. Um, and so, um, where the physician, um, definitely knows the problem because maybe a patient ends up, you know, um, on his count on her or his calendar that then, um, doesn't seem appropriate, but it's really hard to track down, like, where did things um, fall off or what is what are the process steps that are happening and so the other thing that's really key in my role is really making sure that everybody realizes that when things don't work right this is the system problem so this isn't like you know uh john or jane did something wrong if if in a process it's very much more that like the process was set up and maybe it didn't wasn't set up correctly. So we really want to look at how the system is um, done, and not really like, oh well, you know, so and so made the wrong decision. Well, no, they were get they were made the best decision that they had with the information. So maybe they didn't have the right information. Maybe so so definitely making sure we're looking at a system and how do we make sure everybody's able to do their job well and that we give them the information to do that. And it's also clear what they're supposed to do, right? So that we're very clear on that. So um, that's the other thing, just making sure we all recognize that the system's only gonna perform as well as it is designed, right? So it's always gonna give you what you design it to give you. And if it's not designed well, then things happen no matter how well someone tries to catch things. So what we find is when a process isn't well, a lot of people try to do like, oh, I caught that one, that one. But, you know, it's making people kind of almost catch problems. And we really want to have that so that the process is designed so those problems don't really happen. Obviously, there are always going to be certain issues. You can't, you can't design perfection. But if there's, if there's an issue coming, going on and on and on, or that's happening over and over, then we need to figure out how, okay, let's, you know, hold up, let's see, like something's going on, we, we need to um, help to figure that out and not make it so one person has to be like the superstar that then somehow like saves the day every day. Right. So with your, you know, like Disneyland or Disney World McDonald's uh, examples, a lot of it I'm sure has to do with making it a cost efficient and time efficient for the the company but do you also then consider the customer experience and then same with healthcare yeah. like is there a difference between a patient's mentality versus a customer's mentality mm -hmm. i think there is a, a there is definitely a difference um so um in maybe the private sector um i think it's a little bit more straightforward because um, people might disagree with me, but I think it's a little straight, more straightforward because a customer, so so people are incentivized, so a company is incentivized to find value that the customer can recognize as value, right? So yes, they need to do it in terms of they need to be able to make a profit at it. So they need to make sure that um, it can be reasonably done, but 
but it's a you know it's a value over over cost which would then you know create like efficiency so just making sure that like um so that we're like providing value so you know mcdonald's doesn't have any incentive to um put something out that people don't like um because again they're not going to get that repeat business or disney world wants to add that value um because people won't come back um, I think in healthcare, it's a little bit harder um, to see that because um, I feel like in industry, it's very like, it doesn't always happen. I'm not saying everybody gets the best food at McDonald's every time, right? But like they're incentivized to do that and do that um, and to improve um, that. But um, I think in healthcare, it's a little harder to see that direct connection. Um, and I'm going to be a little bit on my soapbox a little bit, but it's harder because sometimes as patients, we can't always tell what is a superior service look like, right? Because we don't know, we don't have that, um, I don't know whether like, eh, you know, like, oh, is this doctor telling me this versus, or is, or is this experience better than this other experience? And obviously, because I don't know what's wrong with me. <laughs> I don't know what I should be, the treatment I should be getting. And so I think it's a little harder to make that connection. Now, I think Mayo does a great job at keeping the needs of the patient front and center. Um, but it is difficult because sometimes what a patient, um, sometimes it's contrary. And we need, I think another thing is we always want to look at, okay, if the patients are telling us that this works better, we need to be listening to them. So. Obviously in all this, we always say the patient is also part of the solution too. And so sometimes we do um, like focus groups and other things or patient surveys to make sure that like for these particular projects, we're always doing patient surveys otherwise, but like for these particular projects to make sure that we're actually making an impact and we didn't like somehow make it better for us and then all of a sudden it doesn't work for the patient. So you bring up a great point. Um, I think, um, it's, you know, um, I think there's a long way to go in healthcare in making it more patient centric. Um, I think Mayo does a great job of um, being there, of doing that, but I, um, but I think just healthcare in general, and now just be told, you know, I'm not working at Mayo, I'm working at Carillion Clinic, I moved to Virginia, moved back, and so I still see those same struggles where we're trying to make sure how do we keep the patient in the center, but um, but still make sure um, you know it's safe, it's effective, and we're doing the right thing. Does that answer your question? Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Does um, the what was the name of the new clinic you're working at? Oh yeah, Carillion Clinic. Carillion. Okay. It's in Roanoke, Virginia. It uh, has about six hospitals cool. um, and it's kind of the Southwest Virginia area. Okay. So. Are they, so you said Mayo was kind of a, a front runner in, the, in this work. Are you mm -hmm. re kind of retracing your steps now at the new clinic? Yeah, so I'm doing some more just again, process improvement work. Um, I'm on a team of um, five people and we work across the system. So again, some of our projects um, I'm still working with diabetes, which is great in the hospital and figuring out how do we make sure um, patients are being managed appropriately um, in insulin. So that means you're like, well, how would Allison, how would you know you're not clinical? I don't know anything clinical, right? Well, I pair with nurses and physicians and we look at the process. So we look at what, um, what is the, how should a patient be treated? And then how do we make sure that that's easy to do each time and that like who needs to do what to make sure that things are happening correctly. Um, and so, and it, you know, again, every patient's different. So it's not like we can just say like, do this, do this, do this. But there are some like standards of care that we know can be done each time and we wanna make sure we have the tools there. So it, it is done um, well each time. Um, so, I'm also working on a project um, regarding sepsis. So like, how does, um, how do we make sure that when we identify when sepsis is happening in the hospital and then what are the things we need to do to treat that? Um, so sepsis is something that can be really well treated if identified early. 
Um, but then if it's not identified early, it's harder. So looking at how could we um, identify that early and actually using some computer models to help us with that, that might help us alert providers to say, hey, we might have sepsis here and you might, you know, let's, let's look at that because sepsis is really hard to distinguish between other things sometimes. And so um, just helping a provider to be like, mm, maybe we need to check this, um, you know, patient's temperature change, whatever, you know, whatever it is, like, let's, let's see. So um, it, there's some really, really interesting um, problems. The other thing that Carillion does a lot of right now is really human factors work. And so when we talk about human factors, we talk about, they do a lot of cognitive uh, human factors. So one of the things they're working on is, um, and industrial engineers have this same thing. A lot of times the specialty of industrial engineering. So for me, I know enough about human factors to be dangerous. I had a few classes in college, but I work with um, other industrial engineers that are like, that's their specialty. And so they look at all the alarms going off in the hospital and what are they supposed to be telling a provider or a nurse? And do we have too many alarms? And what happens, we talk about alarm fatigue. So if we don't have alarms going off at the right, like maybe they're too at a threshold that really, oh, it doesn't really matter. Well, then we're getting more alarm than we don't and we don't react and then we just kind of don't pay attention anymore. It just, it's not that anybody doesn't need it to pay attention. It's just what happens. You can, um, you can hear that when, you know, things in your house start and you just get used to it. And then you like forget and somebody else comes in your house and you're like, why is that beeping? And you're like, oh, I forgot. So those are types of things that we need to understand. And also just measuring how much cognitive capacity do we have at one time and when do we need to help providers or like interruptions in a provider's work like how does that how how do we make sure like how many interruptions can a provider have and, and still be effective um so there's a lot of great cognitive work going on um uh in all this and then how do we design systems so that um or like the medical records so that it's easy to fill out and it makes sense to providers or nurses or whoever's looking at it, it makes sense and they can see what they need. So um, a lot of work there, there's so much cognitive ergonomic or cognitive human factors work that is done to really, that, that really needs to be done in healthcare because I feel like we put a lot on our providers and nurses and everyone working on the front line and there's only so much that that we have by science know that a human brain can handle. And so it's not just, well, just remember to do that. No, 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 you can only remember so many things. So. Right. What kind of education is required to, to become an engineer? Yeah, so um, definitely an engineer is a four year degree. So um, you, you don't need a master's. You can start engineering um, right out. And I would actually like that. I did um, a four year degree and then I worked a little bit and then I ended up deciding to do a master's. But yes, you can do it in four years with an undergrad. And what, um, do you know what the going rate for a starting engineer is right now? Uh, um, industrial or systems? I think it's around, uh, well, it depends on the type of engineer. So I hate to say, and it depends on industry. Um, I know when I start, well, this is really bad because that's like, you know, a while ago. Um, so that would be like 13 years ago. But when I started, it was about 50,000. Um, so um, as, a, as a going rate for an industrial engineer, again, um, you might, depending on industry, that's a little different, depending on the type of engineer. But for us, um, we're kind of right in the middle of the, the pack in terms of engineers, um, in terms of salary wise. But I definitely, when you're looking at it, I know I went to the Bureau of Labor and Statistics and looked at that when I was, as, as I was looking at jobs and just making sure that when you, that like, what is the expected? And then of course it changes across the country and things like that. But, um, yeah, the other thing that I would say just on that topic is there are co-op opportunities when you're within uh, your school. And so what I did when I was an undergrad, um, I actually took some time off. You're actually still in school, but you took some time and you, I went and worked in, in, as a co-op. I got paid 
um, and um, was able to really get some skills and really some on the job skills and really make sure I knew that I wanted to do this before I graduated, which was really helpful. Very cool. Okay. That's, that can't be a very common thing in, in most industries. Yeah, in most industries, it's not. And this is definitely an optional thing. So if you want to get in and get out in four years, you can do that. I took five years because I actually, and a lot of times you can go to school and do this too if you want. Where I went to school, there wasn't a whole lot of um, industry. So I needed to, like, for a variety of reasons, I then took a year and then worked somewhere for a year and then completed my um, third and fourth year. For me, because I didn't know many people that were an engineer, I wanted to try it out before I got all the way through right. um, and make sure this is what I wanted to do. So um, that was like a super good experience. And then it was also helpful because I got out of my undergrad and I can say I had a year of work experience as like a co-op engineer and, and that did help a lot. Very cool. And you know, you talked a lot about using math and science to mm -hmm. solve problems. What other classes might a high school student want to focus on now to be, yeah. to kind of prepare themselves? Yeah. So I know all, a lot of people, I was included with that love math and science, maybe might not like English as well, but that is really important. Being able to do technical writing is super important. Um, even if we're not like writing like huge papers all the time, we're still having to communicate. And so one of the things, or, or make presentations. So being able to um, talk to people is really important um, because um, you're going to you're gonna have all these great ideas and if you can't communicate them, then they only stay in your head and you can't get other people to buy in. So being able to communicate them, even, you know, I can, I consider writing even in emails. Like I need to think about how do I like craft an email so that I can get someone, I'm usually asking them to do something, right? So like, how do I, how do I write the email so it's very clear as what I need? So again, um, it might not be the writing that you're doing right now, but that writing will pay off. Um, and I think it'll be really helpful. And I would say in um, if you're able to in high school, if it's offered, I would try to take all the way through calculus in high school. Um, it might mean, you still might take calculus in college, um, but sometimes you might be able to get credit for it and not take it, but uh, take like, calculus one, but um, I do think having that experience and doing that in high school, do, do as much math as you can in, um, in high school, um, because I think it'll just help you, even if you end up kind of um, kind of doing a refresher in college, I think it will help. Also, I, you know, I took a lot of chemistry, I took chemist a couple semesters of chemistry and physics. Um, so those are the things um, on the science side and all of a sudden, all, obviously a lot of other engineering um, things. So programming was also helpful. Um, so not that it's needed. I didn't know any programming when I came to college. Um, I, I didn't have any, there were no classes like that. So I just started new and I figured it out and it was great. Um, I also didn't have any drafting. Like I took like a drafting class to, just because again, there's some things that all engineers just need to know. And so I did some AutoCAD, um, but I didn't know any of that. So again, don't, if, if your high school has different offerings, take advantage of it, but also just know that there's a lot of things um, that I learned in college and it was great and I figured it out, so. Awesome, so cool. What is the absolute favorite part of your job? I think um, for me, when I, joined healthcare, the coolest part was that when something that I worked on actually affected the patient. So the patient experience got better. Like when I saw that, wow, we figured this out. And although I wasn't doing any of the work, you know, I wasn't necessarily helping to do make, be a part of the process, but just to see that you worked on something that actually improved the patient or just as much improve some people that are working in the process. So somebody's frontline stuff like, wow, this is so much easier for me to do, or this works so much better. That's the thing that really um, makes it all worth it. That um, although it might be sometimes frustrating or you just don't know how this is all gonna work, but when you kind of are able to even do small wins where it's like, oh yeah, this really helped me. 
that really, that really um, kind of makes my day um, to know that 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 work was valued and, and that we were able to kind of, um, uh, make an impact. Um, and that was the one thing in healthcare. I love that like our work goes to the patient. Um, you know, sometimes in other industries, again, a lot of our work, like you pointed out, might be like making it a little bit more efficient or let's, you know, like at Amazon, you might be trying to like shave a second off of like trying to, uh, you know, um, get a box out the door. Um, and yeah, I think that can be really rewarding, but it's really, I felt like even more rewarding when you can see that it, it helped the patient. Um, so, and, and or help save a life or something like that. So it's really cool. Yeah, absolutely. And then final question, um, what is, what's a piece of advice that you would give to any high school student who's wondering what to do with the rest of their life and their career? Yeah. So I would say, stay very open. Don't feel like, I mean, I'm not a great candidate for this because I kind of figured out in high school what I wanted to do, but I don't think, although there's a lot of pressure to be able to tell someone when you're graduating from high school, like I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this. And this is what be open. And when you come get to college, know that you can change and that your, your mind and maybe you, you meet someone that's doing a different major or you, um, or, you know, you talk to someone who's doing that role. That's the other thing I would say is when you do think, oh, I think I know what I want to do, try to find someone who's done it. And so you can figure out what to do. What do you normally do on a daily basis? Because the other thing sometimes is I think in college, um, or even in high school, we have a class that we don't like, and we say, oh, they, and maybe you didn't like the class because maybe the teacher or it was just a bad time in your life, and then you decide to like change your whole trajectory. And so having a little, little bit more information about, no, but I know I want to do this because this job every day sounds really cool. Then when you have those classes that are just, oh, well, I got through it, but it wasn't fun you can then continue on and say, no, but I know this is the right thing to do. Because I would say engineering, the first two years was pretty hard in, um, in college because you weren't taking the classes about industrial engineering yet. You were taking a lot of general classes about general engineering. I was taking classes in civil engineering and uh, you know uh, electrical engineering and mechanical engineering. And I'm like, this isn't really what I want to do, but it was really foundational so that I knew enough to be able to communicate with those engineers. So I would say like definitely talk with someone about what it's like every day and see if you, and, and see if you can shadow them or talk with them. Um, I'm always, uh, uh, and the other thing, if you're female and want to do engineering, um, go for it. Um, you might, feel like in um, uh, your classes, I can remember going, wow, <laughs> you know, I had a class of 150 in, a, in one of my intro engineering classes and there were five women in it and it was a little intimidating, but um, it's, it's a very empowering thing and you can do it. So, so I think find, you know, those um, role models and, you know, I've always, I've been one to hopefully find, um, people that are in the midst of it and I can give them a pep talk and know, no, this is what you want to do. So um, just um, don't let um, maybe being um, a minority either by, uh, you know, race or background or other kind of minority or that you don't know an engineer uh, or, or by gender, let, let that stop you. It, it's doable and it's really cool to talk about. <laughs> Well, Allison, thank you so much. This is super insightful and fascinating. Thank you.